Hello, friends. Uh, my name is Steven. We're here for the Friday Conversation, episode 77. 77. Uh, so, yeah, happy Friday. We're, it's not Friday for us, but it's Friday for you when you listen to this. So, happy Friday. And uh, so, we'll go around the room. Uh, Christopher, can you start us off with some introductions, please? Absolutely. So, I'm Christopher G. Burning, author of the Hellborn King Saga. This is my third time on with, uh, with you and Chris. Uh, glad to be back here. Nice. And Jared? Uh, my name is Jared. I, uh, I'm on the Fantasy Thinker uh, YouTube channel, and this is my first time on uh, f- the Friday uh, conversation, so I'm glad to be here. Nice. And Robin? <laughs> Hello, I'm Robin from uh, Bookends and Biscuits on YouTube channel. I think I've been on one before, maybe, mm-hmm. uh, so it's my, my second time <laughs> on the conversations. Glad to be here. Yes. And some, some new guy, I don't know who this guy is. I don't know who let him in. Uh, who are you again? Yeah, I hope to God you've stopped counting. I've been on this quite a lot, so uh, <laughs> very thankful to Steve for always uh, allowing me to come back, uh, whether they're on Friday or not, as it turns out. Uh, my name's Chris Mullen, sometimes YouTuber, sometimes appear on other people's channels. Always like to have a good chat with uh, with all of the people here, because they're all pretty cool dudes and dudettes. Very much so, Yeah. <laughs> So, so Christopher, you've been busy. Um, so, what what's been the response to the novella? Well, tell us about the novella too. Yeah, so um, I actually have you two to thank for the novella because I was I was kicking around the idea of putting it out, but the last time I was on with you guys, you were talking about how you know you would like to see some novellas, you know, for the series, and that that's really what convinced me to go ahead and pull the trigger and do it. Uh, so, you know, you can you can thank yourselves for it. So, um, but yeah, I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to go back in time a little bit and kind of give you more context of how, of how the saga started because, um, I was starting to get the impression from the readers towards the end of the Wrathbringer that, you know, Damien Dreadfire is more of a villain and I, I, I sensed that the readership was kind of turning against him. So that, you know, I, I kind of want to keep him in the middle as much as I can. Mm-hmm. So I was like, you know what, I think I'm going to pull the trigger on this prequel and give you a better understanding of why he is the way he is and, you know, why, why he's so hell-bent on vengeance and everything. And the response has been really good so far, really, really good. Um, it's, it's, it's a short book. It's, you know, just barely over 60 pages. Um, you can get the ebook for free if you sign up for my mailing list on my website, so that's pretty cool. And, uh, yeah, it's just uh, it's been going great so far. So for the record, I know you've gotten a lot of these questions. What's the what's your recommended reading order? Because I know that some people are asking, should I read the novella first? Should I read the first book first? What what's your recommendation? Uh, you you could read the novella first, but I think just to have greater context, uh, I would suggest reading them in the order that they were published. So it'd be Hellborn King, Wrathbringer, then Servitor of Sin. I, I think from my point of view, if I can jump in and say, yeah. I. I was eager to know what was in the... But having read Hellborn King, then Wrathbringer, you're like, I, I, I want to know now about the events uh, that were going to be in the, in the prequel. You know, you're, you're, you're kind mm-hmm. of thirsty for it, I think. At that stage, right. kind of walking in blind. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then um, in the in the next book, the next full-length installment that I'm working on now, you're going to get even more insight into what happened at Borgifo because Damien's perspective of that whole incident, you don't really know too much about it but um w- without without trying to spoil anything you're going to f- end up finding out even more about the story you know the uh, what happened to lead up to the the whole saga and the whole war so for for, for robin and for jared who aren't familiar with this here i don't think either, uh, they've ever read it yet but what's uh, or anyone yet, else who no. hasn't read it uh <laughs> tell us about what the what's the what's the series about uh, well, the tagline for the first book is uh, "A Kingdom at War, a Royal Family at War with Itself." So um, it starts out two sides. You have you have your your kingdom, which is more more or less like an empire, and then you have your you know your free peoples, your your tribes that have been pushed to the edge of civilization, and um, you know they they decide it's time to unite and fight back, or else you know we're going to get wiped out. And so this this. You know, uh, unstable coalition comes together, and they don't always get along. They don't always see eye to eye. Um, one thing that I that I make it a point to do in my books is is stack conflict, layers of conflict. So you have the overall grand conflict, which is two sides in the war. Then you have conflict going on within each respective side, 
And then you have conflict going on with the characters, whether it's internal or external, like in the case of Gareth, you know, the royal family, sibling rivalry, you know, uh, family imploding around him and everything. So, so there's always there's always some sort of conflict. Um, and uh, I write my battles. Uh, I don't know how many other authors do this, but when I write my battle scenes, it starts from the perspective of a character on one side and ends from a perspective of a character on the opposite side of the battle. So you get to see the the, the battle from you know the entire perspective, both sides. So uh, yeah, it's it's. Some people have said it's a military fantasy, and I, I wouldn't mm-hmm. disagree with them. Uh, the first book especially doesn't have a whole lot of traditional fantasy elements. It's slowly ramping up in the core series. Um, but it's it's really about the characters. It's about the characters and their struggles, um, not only with their daily life, but in this in this war that they found themselves in. And, you know, it's it, it can get emotionally heavy at times. And, you know, you're... <laughs> You're, you're, you're inside these characters' heads, and sometimes what they're thinking isn't exactly what they're saying or doing. So I would say I would say it's definitely character-driven military fantasy. That, that goes really weird in the second book. By the time you get to Wrathbringer, there's some SH-1T that goes down in that book. Like that, that book mm-hmm. kind of takes that military fantasy idea and, as you say, sticks this veneer or level on the top of it of what is much more playful fantasy, you know, with, with what's, what's going on there. It's so good. Yeah, and, and, and the more magical elements that I have, it's more it's more paranormal yeah, than, than anything right. else. It's not like a hard magic system where, you know, this spell does this. Or, like, mm-hmm. it's more supernatural. It's more um, uh, lost knowledge, you know, stuff like that. Because um, I don't, like, for me personally, I'm not, I'm not a real big fan of, you know, high magic. You know, high fantasy stuff like that. So I, I prefer to make my magic more mysterious and paranormal. And you know, like, like you said in Wrathbringer, uh, things start to get a lot dark and more supernatural. And it's it's gonna it's gonna get even worse in the next book that I'm working on currently. <laughs> I like that. I like the idea of the paranormal rather than set magic. That intrigues me. That intrigues me a lot. <laughs> yeah, I gotta agree with that. I. Uh... That sounds fascinating, and and you, this, this first book you started this what back in, twenty twenty one or something. Uh, I published it in twenty twenty one. I started it in twenty twenty, so I went from concept to completion in a year. Oh. And it's yeah, it's over six hundred pages, so it's 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 big. And has a great cover. And it's been revised. Yeah, isn't isn't that right? That's yes. the second edition is out now. Isn't that right, Christopher? Yep, the second edition is out. I trimmed some of the fat on it. Uh, I cut out like twenty thousand just useless words. Oh. Really, really leaned it down. Wow. Because um, yeah, because we had talked about this, Steve. Like you said, sometimes it gets a little wordy in in a couple areas, or you know, it's just unnecessary descriptiveness. And I, I agreed. I agreed. And and so I w- I really wanted to make Hellborn King the book that I thought it always should have been. And so I spent uh, six to eight weeks just just chopping it sentence by sentence wow and I'm, I'm very very happy with the result now it's a much it's a much smoother read and it's yeah it's the book it always should have been people was just discussing how really? he likes to cut the fat out of books in general so <laughs> 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 that's awesome that you could do that yeah I think we'd spoken about that the last time we talked about the you know kind of your development as an author and as a writer. By the time you finish your second book, you feel like the first person who wrote the first book is sort of unrecognizable in some ways, and do you yeah. use that as a as a vehicle to kind of go back and say, well, actually, let's let's use that and then uh, see what we can do. Yeah, kind of cool. yeah, absolutely. In fact, <laughs> in fact, it's all it, it, it's put this bug in my head now where I'm like, well, now should I go through the second <laughs> one and update that? But you know, no, I I no. Nah. I think I think it's fine the way it is. Uh, I'm, I'm focusing as much time and energy as I can into working on the the next installment. I, I'm almost twenty thousand words into it. I'm thinking this one's going to be probably the longest book of the series. Wow. Uh, yeah, I, but I, I'm actually a little nervous about that because uh, Amazon has has limits. Oh. Yeah. Uh, page limits, especially for hardcover. I think it's like five hundred and fifty pages. Oh, wow. So yeah. I'm like, you know, it's like I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, well, you know, I want to write a 300,000 word book, but there's just no way I'm going to be able to put it out on hardcover. 
get a get a soft ending in the middle of it, and then you've got two books. Chris, there you yeah. Go. Oh, yeah. yeah, could split it. <laughs> yeah, I could. Yeah, I thought about that. Um, I am. I am also now going through Ingram Spark so I can get the you know the global distribution and all that. And they have, uh, they have uh, more generous requirements when it comes to to page counts and everything. So, you know, might end up going that route just to just to squeak by because because th- this one, I mean, there's going to be. Uh, two brand new POVs from sides that you know you haven't even had a chance to see yet. Um, at the uh, the epilogue in the Wrathbringer, you're introduced to a new people. There's going to yes. be a POV from from that group of people, and then uh, the Droethians, which you've seen throughout the first two books, you're going to get a POV from them. Wow, <laughs> you've yeah. been busy. <laughs> That's a lot of words, yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so there's going to be at least, uh, I'm just going off the top of my head, you know, six, seven POVs, which is fairly typical with my series. I try to keep it around that mark. I don't want to just have so many different POVs that you end up getting lost or you need a spreadsheet to keep track of everybody, you know. I have a question. Hmm? You said that you started development of the book in 2020? Yep. The first one? Yes. And you're on the... And how many books in we now? Three, would you say? Uh, I've had two two full length books. I just put out the novella, um, which is you know, yep. sixty some odd pages. That was July tenth, and now I'm working on the third main installment. So this will be my fourth book. When is that going to come out? That's a good. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking because you've done what two and a half books so far in in three years. Yeah. The next one you're already working on. That's so much. That's amazing. That's super quick. Yeah. Well, uh, and revi- Ryan Cod- and revised one of them. <laughs> Ryan Cothill kind of makes me feel like a bum yeah. because I can't I can't write as fast as he can. But uh, I, I I really want to get this next one done next year. But with it potentially being as long as I think it's going to be, uh, I can't make any promises. And I know that's that's just killing you, Chris. I see the anguish in your face right now. But but, but, but Ryan does it full time. Like the, I, I'm sort of realistic, uh, and, the, and these kind of things kind of go on. Like that's it'll, as long as it's worth. You know the way, you know that kind of stuff. You, you can take ten years uh, to do. It. Don't take ten years. Well, that's not good. <laughs> 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 like, there are limits, but but that, that idea, like you have a job, you've you know, mm-hmm. you're getting buff. All, all of, of these bu- things are happening. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm yeah. wondering what kind of routine do you have yeah. to to get that kind of material out? Like, what kind of discipline do you do for yourself? Oh boy, um, j- just sheer determination just 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 <laughs> sheer willpower i mean there's so many times where i'm like i you know i uh i go to work you know i mean i get up at like uh quarter to five each morning uh go to work you know 10 hours a day and then i go to the gym for an hour and then i mean there's more more often than not when i get home i'm just i'm too exhausted to write but i just i force myself to I just just keep pushing and pushing wow. And and really, it's about it's you know the fans you know it, it, as corny and cliche as it sounds, the fans, the readers are really the ones that are keeping me going because everyone that that has enjoyed the series is like, when's the next one coming? When's the next? <laughs> so I don't want to let anybody down, so I I, I want to keep as much momentum going as I can. I have, I have further questions. I, I don't apologize. know. I mean, I mean, but like but but like my actual writing routine, it like like I go I go all out. Like I prefer to write at night. That's when my creativity comes out. Mm. So once it's dark, um, I, I have LED lighting like all around my desk, my keyboard, and just everything. So I'll turn the lights out, turn the LEDs on. You know, I'll, I'll burn some incense. I'll listen to some music <laughs> and just really immerse myself into whatever character I'm writing at the time. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. So did I, you did you plan the whole series or did you plan book by book? Oh, I I know how the whole series is going to turn out. Uh, in fact, okay, in fact, okay, I had the whole I had I had the whole series planned out as I was uh, coming up with the concept for the first book and and, and just starting to write it. Okay. Now I'm I, I'm not a rigid plotter. I do I, I'd say between plotting and pantsing, I am fifty fifty, sometimes sixty forty, one way or another. I always like to leave a little wiggle room for the unknown because sometimes when I'm writing it's just like I'm, I'm just feeling it going in a certain direction and that may be totally contrary to what i had planned and now it's like great now i gotta change the whole rest of the book now so um but but ultimately i know where i want it to go i know who's gonna live who's gonna die in fact i even know the last mm. scene of the last book oh. already got it planned out in my head so oh wow yeah it's, it's gonna cool. take a few years to get there though it, it's interesting to say that because i would say there's 
a very strong emotional core runs through the book. You know, the, it, it gives it propulsion, etc. But like, the characters are very emotional the whole way along. Mm. Like, do you know what I mean? That, that whether that's kind of laziness, even at one point, they're emotionally lazy, <laughs> you know, even <laughs> or, or inactive as a thing. But but then at other times, they're really used that to propel you and the story forward. And I think that ca- kind of character work is one of the things that I really love about it. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I I try to put I try to put myself into not all my characters, but some of my characters. Uh, like Gareth is, is like all the negative traits in me amplified from mm-hmm. like when I was a uh, you know a young man, you know, teenager, early twenties. You know, the insecurity, the the just feeling lost in life, uh, just having no real purpose. So I'm drawing inspiration from that, and then like Einar is like my sense of right and wrong, and loyal <laughs> loyalty to friends and stuff like that. So. Uh, and then um, Damien, are, Damien is like uh, the the dark, like negative thoughts in my head. You know, just like the anger, something that I feel sometimes, or frustration. So I just I use those those emotions, those feelings to draw on, and and that's 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 why some of these characters are are so heavy yeah. when when you're reading them, and and especially especially you know somebody like Gareth. I mean, he's he's kind of a polarizing character because some people they 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 empathize with him. Or they absolutely can't stand him because he's just like, you know, he's just a man child. You know, he just, he's just annoying to read. But it's like, you know, he's coming from a certain place. And if you can, you know, if you can uh, empathize with that, you, you, you really, you really like, man, you know, I kind of see, maybe I kind of see myself in this character. I've had friends that said that they see themselves in, in Madeline, for example, mm-hmm. with her struggles, especially in, in Wrathbringer. So have, having such a cast of characters that, that, that are so different, I, th- I think there's some kind of something for everybody that you can identify with and see yourself as hmm. <laughs> and and it's just um how many books are going to be total in the series do you think so uh i'm planning on five full-length five. books okay. in the core series um then there's the prequel novella there may be another novella in there possibly and then um i plan on doing like a two to three book spin-off series after that's based in the same world oh so I have a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> You've been does, busy. Yeah, it, it does strike me though, especially from here to talk about like your journey. I'd see another lot of people before they read the first book. They spend years researching how to release a book, you know, so long before rather than actually worrying about the writing, you've kind of done it a bit more emergently. Do you feel like, you know, obviously the fact you went on revisions, etc. would kind of suggest that, but you kind of feel like that emergent thing has kind of given you a good sense of, right, what the next three, four, five books are gonna are gonna be in terms of planning and in terms of time scale and everything that needs to happen from doing it that way, rather than kind of having this. I'm sure you did research beforehand, but you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. This kind of world that where people get caught in that loop. Oh yeah, yeah, a- a- absolutely, absolutely. Um, and with each release, you know, you just learn more and more, and you streamline it better. But yeah, that first one was many, many hours of you know just at work throwing in the earbuds and, and just you know running youtube videos people talking about you know how how to self-publish uh, but before that i actually tried to get traditionally published right um I'd, I'd sent out queries to 50 agents and i got 50 rejections in fact mm-hmm. i only had one rejection that was somewhat personalized because because typically it's all just a copy paste dear author yeah. thanks for your submission you know um, but, yeah yeah but but i did get one that had a little bit of personalization and uh, she said, because uh, I submitted the prologue for the Hellborn King, mm-hmm. and she said, I think you're starting your story in the wrong spot. And so that, that, that got me thinking. And so then I went back, I cut out like 80% of the prologue and rewrote it into what it is now. And I did that in two days. And <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, it, it, it's, it's fantastic, I think. I think it, it was so much fun to write. And um, yeah, so. Once I did that, I'm thinking to myself, you know, maybe maybe I'm just meant to go my own way and, and self-publish. Because that was originally my, my first plan in my head when I first started coming out. Hey, you know, I want to I wanna write a book. It's like, well, you know, I should probably just self-publish it because no, no publisher will give me the time of day. And it turns out that that feeling was correct. Uh, so, yeah, I ended up, yeah, just ended up doing it myself. It's been a blast. I've, I've, I've made friends all over the world. I've sold copies in 14 countries and it's, nice. you know, it, it's, it's growing more than I ever thought it was. So yeah, I'm learning a lot more and with each release, it's just going to get better and better. I mean, like the, the Wrathbringer release was a train wreck. Absolute train wreck. 
<laughs> but the one for Servitor went very smooth. So yes, I've, I've learned a lot. Uh, from from the outside looking in, I would have never guessed it was a train wreck. Oh yeah, I mean, I was up at four thirty in the morning, just sweating bullets, like, oh my god, this is it's release day, and Amazon's rejected my sub, my my uploading because something was right. something was wrong with either the formatting or the artwork, or you know, and I'm I'm sitting there four thirty in the morning, just frantically trying to trying to to fix it all, and yeah, it was a very very stressful day when it should have been a very enjoyable day. <laughs> yeah, but lessons learned. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, the next one. You sound like you're taking a lot, of, a lot of feedback and working that as well, because you said that, um, for example, Steve said it was a bit heavy, so you've kind of reduced the number, and you said mm. that you then um, changed things, and you said the novella was based on the fact of the feedback you were getting from one of the characters. So is it fun being able to take that feedback and then loop it back into the future books? Is that helping you out there from getting that? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um I, I, I will say this, if if anybody guesses a particular plot point I have for a character, you have my word, I will not I will not change it. I will not change <laughs> it. So But uh but yeah, I mean like uh Steve and Chris, I mean I wouldn't have put out this novella if it wasn't for you guys. You guys really were oh, the ones that, that cool. convinced me to do it. Um you know, had the idea, was was toying around with it and then you know, just decided uh Originally, when I was going to write, I was like, "Oh, you know, I only want it to be maybe like twenty thousand words. It's it's less than that now, but I, I mean, twenty thousand words. I'll get this done in two, three weeks." Hubris. Nine months later, and it still wasn't done. Of course, I was having a I was having an existential crisis, and my life was melting down at the at the moment. So yeah, that book damn near killed me. Yeah, <laughs> trying to get that thing finished. It's a nice metaphor for the series. <laughs> You know, everybody's sort of having an yeah. existential crisis of some sort. Yeah, I, I mean, I, d- I did want Servitor to be a little bit longer, but I was like, you know what? It's it's lean. It's sort of it, it, it does what I want it to do. I'm not going to pack it with fluff. I just want to get this done and just get it out in the world. Just and put it behind how do, me. How do you guys feel making your friend? <laughs> the experience for writing that one was not yeah. pleasant. <laughs> how do you feel making your friend have an existential crisis, guys? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly wasn't the intention. We were just looking like. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm glad you did it because I really enjoyed it. Yeah. But you know, no no crisis necessary next time for sure. <laughs> I don't. I can't I, think. I, of, I, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead, Jack. Oh no. I just. I. I gotta admire that that fortitude of, of being able to write that many. Uh, that many words. Um, in such a short time cuz uh it, it, back when i was writing it took me a year like to just to write 15,000 words never mind how much you've packed out I, that's incredible i i uh and it was painstaking for me <laughs> so <laughs> um yeah. so i uh i really uh kudos to you really that 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 stuns me it really does and i and, and uh i'm uh, looking forward to uh checking it out yeah, I, I I would always try to write either six pages a day or at least a thousand words a day, and I was doing that fairly consistently with the first two books. Um, but it's just it's really been slowing down. I th- I think I do have a little bit of burnout just from mm-hmm. pushing so hard. Um, so right now I'm doing three to five hundred words a couple days a week <laughs> when I'm able to. But uh, you know I'm close to twenty thousand words on it, and uh, I. I I want I want to invest more time and I need to invest more time in it because I, I work a different I work uh, at, at a different company now and uh, my winter schedule is extremely demanding extremely demanding I'm up at all hours of the night some you know it's uh, I worked a couple of twenty six hour shifts so it's really hard to be creative and have the energy to write when you know when you're that sleep deprived so I'm, I'm trying to get in as much work now as I can before winter arrives. <laughs> You've got to embody some of your characters. Are Damien Dreadfire at the R23 of your 26 R shifts? You know, trying to keep yeah. going. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that uh, I, I struggle to think of a set of books where nearly all of the characters are so divisive around the audience. You know, people, there's, I can only think of one character that is universally loved by everybody, which I think is probably Titan. 
I think is the one person that everybody yeah. everybody loves him, but everybody else is sort of mixed on everybody else in some way, shape, or form. That must be cool yeah, to get and, feedback and, on. And, and and that's exactly what I was going for. I, I wanted that. I wanted to create discussion around yeah. characters and have people love some and hate the others. But yeah, Titan is one that everybody seems to love, and he was a he was a late addition to book one. Uh, I think I had maybe I don't know. 40 close to 50 percent of it written before the idea for him. for him popped in my head i was like you know i, re- I really just kind of want to write an old soldier who's just he's seen too much he's swallowed too many horrors he's he's lost too many people around him and just throw him into the mix and just kind of just kind of see what happens and i didn't really have anything planned out for him for for book one it was just kind of let's just see what happens and then um when i got finished uh, with the Hellborn King, I decided to make Titan the the, the focal point for the Wrathbringer, and he's uh, he's the character that's on the cover of that. And yeah, he, he one of the most fun characters for me to write. My other favorite character is Lucetta, just because of how how mad she is. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so so writing him's a lot of fun. I just I just get to let loose. Uh, the profanity's flying, you know, uh, a lot of good action scenes with him. Uh, and the other thing that I really like is that with with Madeline, he has he has this friendship with her that's not romantic in any way. It's just they 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 are bonded through what they've experienced in combat, and so it's a it's a very close friendship that's more like uh, uh, almost like big brother little sister type thing in a way. Like like he doesn't have any sort of romantic feelings toward her, you know, because. You tend to see that in, in, in books where you know the the female character, all the males are fawning, and you know there's always some sort of romantic this or that or some love triangle or something. And I really didn't want to do that with him. I just wanted to have a platonic, um, you know, bond that they've developed because they didn't because they they almost came to blows when they first you know met each other, and you know just through what they experienced together, they're 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 super tight, and that that's been a lot of fun to write. There are there are. Uh, several like really uh, strong friendships that I enjoy writing. The other one is Gareth and Sir Edmund. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, Sir Edmund friends. is actually based on my real life best friend, um, and some of the conversations that those characters have had are inspired by conversations I've had with my friend, um, uh, Lucetta and the Woman in Black. That's another odd friendship <laughs> that's a lot of fun to write. Yeah, you can see that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Einar and Damien was Damien, another one yeah, that was really fun to write. Except Einar, you know, well, without getting into spoilers, he's he's off doing his own thing in Wrathbringer. But uh, you know, you'll you'll see him you'll see him back in the mix again in the next book. So yeah, I mean, just it's just there's just a lot there's just a lot that that I enjoy writing. And if I ever feel like I get stuck on a certain character in a certain chapter, I have a I have a big enough cast that I can just jump to somebody else and just always keep that momentum going. That's something we talked about during the ex- – we, we, well, we just finished The Expanse, uh, Robin and Chris and Layla and uh, Suzanne and I. But one thing we talk about is the platonic uh, relationships with men and women not having to have a romantic connection. It's something mm-hmm. that's it, – when it feels for us, it just – without naming any names in The Expanse, it just feels – yeah, but just having that platonic, I, I appreciate that because we don't always need a, a romantic connection for, the, for us right. to care about them. It could be platonic. Yeah, exactly, and and I think, uh, you know, for those for those that have read the Wrathbringer, you you really get a, a sense of just how of how strong that bond is between Titan and Madeline, um, and that that some of those chapters were heavy. Some of those chapters were not easy to write at all, um, and just just trying to put myself in that headspace, like 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 what would happen? What would it, like like what would I feel like if one of my close friends went through something like this like like how how would i feel and then i just i pour that out onto the page do you find it um easy to use um conversations you've had with friends and stuff like that in your writing or is it uh because i always found it difficult to do that i never was able to bring that out in my writing, like the conversations I've had with friends like that and transform it into the characters on the page. Is that something that uh, you find comes naturally? or? Yeah, it's, it's actually pretty easy for me to do. And sometimes if, if I'm really feeling a certain uh, interaction in a scene, I'll just punch out all the dialogue. I won't have any 
exposition or nothing. I'll just it'll, it'll just be just pages of dialogue, and then I'll go back in and just kind of fill in, you know, like you know, little exposition to kind of break up the the chunks of dialogue. But yeah, I mean, like when two characters oh, nice. are having a back and forth, it's it, it's pretty easy for me to to get the, the conversation flowing. But my 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 dialogue, I mean. Is it is it exceptional? No. Is it terrible? No. I, I like I don't I don't really have any like really memorable like I mean like George R. R. Martin like like some of his dialogue lines he comes it's just like man how do you think of this stuff it's great you know my 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 dialogue is more like you can actually picture yourself being in a room and there's just two two people having you know just a modern type of conversation uh, that 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 sort of realism is something that I really wanted to put into my books and you know because so dialogue can be either hit or miss either it's too <laughs> flowery or it's just you know it's not uh, intricate enough it's boring or whatever but I think I think I kind of walk a, a, a fine line between you know uh, um, dialogue that, that that drives doesn't drag but yet it's also it's it's got substance to it yeah because I was I was gonna say quite often with books it can be difficult because conversation you read is not usually exactly the same as one you would have in real life you've got to right. cross that border otherwise it doesn't read correctly so it must be quite mm-hmm. difficult obviously you've worked it out quite well but it must be quite difficult to translate it into a readable kind of format especially if you're working from things from real life so that must be that's, that's really awesome that you've obviously got that down <laughs> uh, i mean it, it definitely can be difficult what i do when i write and i don't know how many authors do this when I'm working on a scene, I actually play it out in my head like I'm watching a movie. So, like, like if some uh, character walks into a tavern, I'm actually picturing that in my head. Like, you know, the, the camera's coming through the door, you, you see the tavern, you see the characters, and then I'm just kind of just writing down what I see. And then if two characters are having a conversation, I picture it in my head as if I'm watching a movie. And they're sitting down and they're talking like, okay, well, what would this guy say and how would this guy respond? And so it just... it. It plays out in my head that way, which uh, hopefully one day when I get my HBO series, uh, you know, <laughs> it'll, it'll be ready to go, you know. <laughs> that's really fascinating, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's really, really visual, actually. Yes, how, yes. Um, I'm, yeah. I'm definitely a very visual person. Uh, I've always loved movies. Um, this this always comes as a, as a surprise to people when I do podcasts. Uh, I'm actually not a reader. I don't enjoy reading at all. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I, I, I can't. I can't. Just, just something in my brain. When I and I have books that I bought, just you know, just just to kind of study how the you know I, I've got George R. R. Martin, Abercrombie, Sanderson. You know, I, I've got a bunch of books, and I wanted to buy and just like physically see how they did it on the page. And I'm reading, and I'm like, you know, yeah, this is really good stuff. But my brain reaches a certain point where I just can't take it anymore, and I have to put the book down because I'm probably just way too ADD to really enjoy reading. But uh, I've always enjoyed writing. I've been I've been writing my own stories and stuff since I was like in third grade. That's no, something that, that. <laughs> yeah. Was, we were I don't remember if it was during the recording or not yesterday, but Chris and I were discussing that with uh, Jenny and uh, Holly uh, about your writing being very uh, cinematic. It's very like dynamic, and it does it. It's it's almost it reads almost like a movie. So that's interesting to hear you say that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that, that's exactly how I how I wrote it. Especially my battle scenes, um, the way the way I write battles kind of came about when I used to do uh, browser based uh, freeform RPGs, mm-hmm. and you know you would uh, the certain website um, you would you would create your own nation, you'd create your own just everything. It was completely freeform, and then and then sometimes you would. You would get into wars with other players, and, and you would write out a battle scene, and then they would respond to it, and then you'd go back and forth until somebody would win. So um, I sort of have that experience with, with writing combat, and uh, when I write a battle scene, I'm not I'm not playing against another player. I'm playing against myself, essentially. So I'll write a scene, you know, the infantry moves this way, and the cavalry moves this way, and there's archers doing this. And then when I get – then when I flip it and go to the next chapter, it's like, okay – how would I respond to that? Or how, like, like how would all these attacks, like how, how would that hit me and, 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 and my force and everything? And then I just kind of plan it out and play it out that way. So, um, but again, you know, picturing it in my head, like a movie, like, uh, in, in Hellborn King, when, when they're at Black Wolf Pass, that, that whole thing plays out in my head, like a movie, like I'm watching it. Yeah. Uh, same thing with, uh, with, with, 
Well, I, I don't want to say too much, but uh, another big battle that takes place in the book. Again, <laughs> playing out in my head like a movie. Like I can all, like I, I can just I can just see it, and then I just right. take everything I'm seeing, the sights, the sounds, the the, the thundering of the earth when the cavalry is just all that, and I just you know sprinkle in the little descriptions, you know, in my in my little chunks of exposition. I'm now just thinking about the people you're playing against and then them getting this like chapter of battle and then being like, oh my god, wow. <laughs> I was, I how was am I going to respond to this? I was good back in the day. <laughs> yeah, I think, I, think, I, think, I think doing that sort of gaming really gave me an edge as far as writing battles. Uh, I've been told from many, many people that my battle scenes are, are very well done, which big relief because I, I i was worried that that'd be one area where i would kind of drop the ball you know because but battles are battles are tricky you know you're either good at them or you're really not and i i was i wanted i, I want to have big battles in my books like kind of like in fact the the, the battle that's going to be in the next installment is going to be even bigger than the one that was in the wrathbringer and that that battle was five cha- it spanned over five chapters mm-hmm. yeah uh jared what kind of battles battles do you enjoy what, what kind of battles for? do I enjoy? <laughs> what, do you, what, what uh, uh, like descriptives or like what do you look for for to say like that's a great <laughs> battle scene? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, let's see. I I don't know. I, I I suppose I like I like um I like the multiple POV factors. Like I'm uh, you know I'm a big Erickson fan, so he, during his battles he has a lot of multiple POVs from all the different soldiers that are involved in the battles, and um. So I, I really enjoy that a lot. Um, it's uh, it's not as cinematic as like um, watching Game of Thrones or something like that on TV, uh, but um, you know, the, but you get a lot of character insight into how they're feeling about the battles. Um, so that's, I guess that's uh, that's how I like to uh, read about that stuff. <laughs> what about you, Robin? Oh, I was hoping you weren't going to put me on the spot. Um, not the usual things <laughs> I kind of read. I'm not a hugely into um, big battle um, books a lot of the time. Um, but actually, I would have to agree with Jared. Generally, it's the ones where maybe you've got um, the cast doing smaller pockets rather than the huge scenes. Um, so you're able to kind of follow what the, what's happening in the small areas rather than the sweeping ones. But... Um, to be honest, it's something I could I could do with reading more of because it's not something that I usually pick up. So, hmm. lots more to discover, I'm sure. You need more blood and guts in your life. <laughs> Clearly, I do. Yeah. Clearly, yeah. I do. Clearly, I do. Yeah, I'm used to <laughs> describing uh, what I like. Or it's one of those things. Once you're really good, when you go, yeah, that was good. And if you read one that's not so good, you kind of go, well, that wasn't good. Good. Describing why one worked. <laughs> and why one didn't can be sort of tough but I, I generally like one where I know the geography of the battle well you know what I mean it, regardless of where right. the action is happening actually where is it in context you know and I think that's probably helps where you, you look at the cinematic element because as a camera view you've got to do the same thing yeah absolutely yeah and when you said the, the battle lasts quite a while it's there's it's not just people swinging swords for, for five it's all these other things happening and like sabotage and all these other strategies going on so there's all these other things intertwined with it because i think when certain authors i won't name any names they they focus so much on the on the physical part of it like the actual battle of the swinging the sword and i block or my shield whatever that just gets exhausting for me like i just i lose interest in it um but when it when it's there's so many different povs and you're invested in the characters and there's things happening that are meaningful and things that, you know, they do things to each other, try and sabotage each other, they try to gain an advantage over each other. That makes it much more interesting to read because it's, it's not just battles. It's you get in the heads of the characters and what's happening almost, you know, in the, you know, in the larger, it's the larger, in the larger story, but also on in the ground level, you know, everyone trying to survive. So for me anyway. Right. And like, well, for me, uh, yeah, there's the you know the, the typical sword swinging and everything, but my my violence that I have in my scenes it comes in short controlled bursts. So it's like you know here's you know here's an exchange between two soldiers, but then you know the character is kind of like 
you know, like he'll he'll step back and he'll just kind of assess and see what's going on, or he'll have some dialogue with another character, or maybe a thought pop in his head, and then maybe a little bit more action. So it's not just just constant sword swinging or you know arrows flying. It's like I try I try to break it up and have it ebb and flow because that's what battle you know, especially in medieval battles, they they weren't just nonstop violence constantly. You know, the, <laughs> sometimes they would meet, they'd have contact, and then they'd separate, and then they'd come back. You know, and Sometimes battles could could t- last days, uh, and it's not it's not just hours and hours of hacking and slashing. You know, it, it, battles just really don't turn out that way, especially you know medieval battles. And so that that's another layer of realism. Like me, mm-hmm. for me personally, that I, that I try to put into my into my uh, writing, especially in Wrathbringer. There, um, there uh, in the big battle, the really big battle that I have towards the end of the book. Um, when one of the POVs switches over to Gareth, it's like you're almost get, catching a break from the action because mm. he's sitting he's sitting way back on horseback. He's he's seeing everything that's happening, and then you're kind of getting more geography of what's happening, and that just gives you a chance to kind of catch your breath, and then you're right back into the action again. Because I think if you just do too much constant action, you just you, you get burnt out on it, you know. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't like that in movies when, when you get all these close-up, quick cuts, that you can't really tell what's going on. You just get all these sudden slashing movements in your face and stuff like yep. that, and you don't really get a sense like a, what Chris said, like of geography and like what's going on with the battle. You just have all these close-ups and and people yelling and dying and and uh, <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, that always bugged me when I was watching movies, you know. Um, and then and, uh, so, shaky cam concept. Yeah, the shaky cam. Oh, I that, hate that, shaky that, cam so that much. That bugs the hell out of me. Oh, <laughs> but, uh, I hate it. But, uh, yeah, me too. And uh, so, like, like I, I like to have that sense of place, like, like the, the, you know. And uh, in, in, a, in, in a book, it's better. It's even better when you also have the character's point of view and you're, you're emotionally invested in the character's that um, are participating in that battle, and you can also um, get a sense of feeling about the battle as well. Maybe you want to read it. Does that for me when I read it? <laughs> <laughs> it's very. It's a very fast. Um, a very quick read. It's a, it's it's a thick book. Well, I think this is the original version, but it's mm-hmm. it's very thick. But it's a it just reads really really fast. It's really just moves. There's not a lot of and not in a, in a in a really smooth way. But it's not you know clunky or anything. There's not like you're never really bored. It's fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can't. Uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I I, I with my prose, I, I try to keep my prose as accessible as possible. Um. I've heard I've heard from many people that oh you know I mean this book is 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 massive but I just I plowed through it like in no time like uh, Andrew from Andrew's Wizardly Reads read it in two days oh, you know because okay. he's he's like it's just he, he yeah he just said it's so he's like it's just so smooth it flows so well and you know it's you know it it's not obnoxious with the with the word usage and everything it's just yeah. and, and and that's my goal was was even though it's grimdark and grimdark isn't really mainstream I wanted to make it more accessible to a wider audience and I really just kind of pigeonhole myself into in the grimdark hmm. I don't know I think after you read that prologue you've really made your mind up about whether you can handle that book or not <laughs> very true very true <laughs> and if anybody that's watching this uh, wants to check out the prologue uh, you can go to my website and you can read it for free oh I can get you just and then you can kind of decide if you want to invest in the series. Well, I just went and bought that. it, so I should have read the prologue first. But I'm, I'm in it now. <laughs> you <laughs> really should have, but you're there. <laughs> it's it's an old timer Robin. prologues. I, I think it's oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Let us there. know, Robin, when you if you want to want a buddy read it. I'll, I'll read yeah, it. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, actually, that'd be wonderful. I'm looking to do some yeah. buddy reads for my um yeah. for my challenges this year. So <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> oh, cool! Yeah, yeah. You're, you're falling classic to the the fallacy of I finished the series, therefore I'll start twenty more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Steve. If you're going to reread it, um, 
once we get off here, uh, uh, shoot me your information. I'll send you a copy of the second edition. Oh, right. well, I'll, I'll buy one. I want to support you. I'll, I'll, I'll pick you, one up. You sure? Yeah. Uh, I'm willing yeah, to send you one. No, I'll, uh, I'll make sure you you see that number tick up on, on yeah. Amazon. You know, I'll be happy to buy another one. <laughs> want to see the graphs in your Twitter? Go, look, look what happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but, uh, but as far as prologues go, and uh, and Chris, you're, I, I'm sure this is just going to make make your uh, you're not helping anxiousness even worse. <laughs> the the pro the prologue for the for the next main installment, it's it's the best I've re- it's the it, it's the best writing I've done yet. It's it's like I'm I'm just so hyped to get it out. I mean, it that that prologue is easily by far the best prologue so far. What, 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 what it's makes what makes a good prologue? I, is my question to that. I guess. Great question. Oh this boy! So person. so my prologues. Uh, what I do with my prologues is um, they're always from a perspective of a character that's not a main POV. It's 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 a side character. It's just it's somebody you that that's just you don't know. It's unimportant or whatever. And then and then you get you get an insight into what's happening in the world from their perspective. And I and I don't want to say too much more because then I might spoil things for you but uh um yeah my uh s- some people skip prologues do not skip my prologues because you'll be confused when you hit chapter one and you're like okay well what's going on because the prologue always believe i always have it bleed directly into the first chapter there's there, there's always some sort of you know deep connection between the two especially especially in the uh, um the new one that i'm working on now it's it, literally it goes from the end of the prologue straight into chapter one I'm like, in, I'm fact, not... in fact, in fact, Chris, what I'm thinking of doing with this with this new prologue is contacting my narrator, uh, who who did the the mm-hmm. audio book for the Hellborn King, and having him just narrate the prologue, the prologue, and then just put it out, just put it out as a as a teaser, as a little sampler or whatever for the new mm-hmm. book. So, mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm strongly considering doing that. That's a super cool idea. That's a, that's that, a nice idea. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I like that. I'm just going to ask you, like, you obviously released. You know the novella. You give it away with the newsletter, obviously. You know that kind of stuff. Have you seen interaction with the first two books then from that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. In fact, I've 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 sold more copies of the Hellborn King with this latest release than than the Servitor of Sin. It's crazy. <laughs> it's sincere, isn't it? That's so good. Yeah, it is. And 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 then uh, I when I released the Wrathbringer and then Servitor of Sin, I put the Hellborn King up the ebook mm-hmm. up for free. Just to kind of get people into into the series and everything, and um, I think I was close to six hundred downloads on Amazon of the Hellborn King. Wow! It was yeah, it was a lot. It, it was it was like four or five times as many downloads as Servitor got that day. So that's awesome. Yeah, yeah I mean, cool. I I just I, I just want people to get into the series, and and yeah. what better way to do that than you know to to give something away. <laughs> Well, I mean, in its own right, if they, if those people read, even, you know, 10% of them read the first book and they enjoy it, I mean, they're going to go and get Rathbreaker, you know. It's not the kind of right. thing that you'll just be like, oh, I'm happy with that. You'll, you'll not be. You'll be like, <laughs> <laughs> I want to keep yeah, going. Absolutely, you yeah. will not be happy with just that. Because <laughs> <laughs> this is a series I do intend on finishing within, you know, uh, don't don't hold don't, me to this. Don't but, you put know, a date. <laughs> the next several years, let's just se- several years. Uh, I, I I will not, and I've I've made this promise many times. I will not do what certain mainstream authors have done and go more than a decade without putting out the next book. I, I will not do that. I will not do that. Uh, this is this is the story I feel like I was meant to tell, and uh, I'm not going to. Do, I'm not going to write anything else until I get the Hellborn King saga finished. Hmm. So I, mission. I have to ask Robin, what about paranormal is makes it intriguing for you? What what is it about paranormal integrated with fantasy that makes it interesting for you? Uh, that was purely for me, just because hmm. I hadn't 
uh, I haven't, well, maybe I have, I'm not sure, but from memory, haven't thought of a magic system that's more paranormal than it is classic magic. I mean, I, I read a lot of older fantasy about the new stuff, so I'm not sure. But um, yeah, I think that's just an interesting twist, especially talking about massive battles and stuff. Like the idea that it's more paranormal than pew pew magic just, it just doesn't <laughs> intrigue me. I don't know. Well, so, not... so far, so so far in the first <laughs> couple of books, there really isn't any magic or paranormal stuff in the battles. But that's going to change in this next book. Oh, yeah. yes, it's going to start bleeding into more facets of the story. Yeah. I, I I think what's interesting about the paranormal aspect for me is it creates a mystery element of what the hell yes. actually is yes. going on. What is? Well, I get this explained to me. What what is? Like the bits that we've been shown, okay, I can see that, I've been told that, but what does it mean to every other character in this story and stuff? And, and it's that mystery that becomes kind of delicious to read that you kind of go, oh, mm-hmm. I think I've worked it out. Thank you. Thank you for explaining why that that's exactly what I wanted to say there, actually. That, that's it. It makes it more mysterious, for sure. Mm-hmm. 100%. Mm. And, and also, one of the, one also, the most common yeah. questions I get is who is the woman, woman in black? black. Yeah. <laughs> you will also, not you find can... that out for a little while. You can also consider, is it really happening or not? Yeah, it's always the question. Is it paranormal? Is yes. it not? Is it, is it reality? Is it not? You know, those mm-hmm. are all questions that you have. I've heard, I've heard so many so many entertaining theories on that, and I just, <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. That's exactly what I was going for. I wanted to create discussion and, and you know, debate and have, you know, just, I've heard, I've heard people come up with theories. I'm like, huh, you know, that, that's very interesting, but I, I never even thought of that being a possibility. You're like that'll be for my next book. Taking notes. <laughs> taking notes. Uh, so I have to ask you. Know, we've Chris and I have like a thread going of all the different predictions we have. You don't have to specify, <laughs> but are we are we close on any of the predictions I don't want or to anything? Know. <laughs> no, no, don't tell us what exactly. But are do we have do we nail anything at all? Um, I did. I did read that. I, I probably have to go back and double check, but I think there was um, one prediction that I was like, uh, it, it's something I, I, I'm not 100% sold on, but it's it's where I'm strongly Strong leaning prediction. toward. Yeah. So, yeah, at least with one of them, I, I again, I'll have to go back and reread the thread, but um, on one of them, I was like, yeah, he's, he's, he's getting close. He's getting close on this one. I can't tell you what it is. Though. No, don't tell us. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite things about making predictions is being spectacularly wrong. That's honestly, it's, you know, when you think, you think you're so sure of yourself, and you're like, "Yes, I've got this. I know what's going to happen." You're like, "None of that happened." No, no. <laughs> but again, if anybody does correctly guess something I plan on doing, I'm, I'm not going to cheese ball it and just say, "Oh, nope, 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 not 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 going to do that." What, no, what like what they used to say about the ending of Lost when people predicted the ending of Lost after like series two, like oh mass, and like no, it's we can promise it's definitely not that got to the end of Lost and everybody's like that's exactly what you said wasn't going to happen yeah exactly that. Yeah. yeah they didn't Lost like write it episode by episode they didn't know what was going to happen at the end didn't they uh, but, so the, they just yeah the problem with Lost was they only planned for a couple of series and it became so successful yeah. that the networks meant we need another four series and this is like what are we going to do for another four yeah. series of this stuff and they just went episode read by episode what everyone wrote yeah. and then just take that yeah. <laughs> so disappointing Okay. I'm I'm trying not to talk shit about the series we just finished <laughs> with stretching things out. <laughs> oh, oh my! You said it was a good series, Steve. You can't take it back. I don't now. know if he did. I don't know, Steve. I think overall, I think it could have been six books instead of nine. The Expanse, I think maybe, but you know, it was okay. It was fine. I enjoyed it. It was fine. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah, I think that's another thing about buddy reads that you mentioned, Robin. Is in, with uh, Jared. You know, we're reading and Chris. Well, we're always reading books together, but the, um, reading with with the group makes it more enjoyable, no matter what it is. Yeah, hundred percent. Love a buddy read. I think we were just saying right at the end of our read that it's just having having those discussions where you're talking about your predictions and whether they're right or not it's just it's just um it's good fun just to have those with people who see things differently yeah. than you do it's always a good thing to explore i think um sure. so yeah it's good yeah no chris chris made me like the forever war much better than i did at first <laughs> <laughs> so 
It was good. I liked. It. I liked that. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I, I remember having a conversation about a movie, and it's one of those ones that's like four hours long, right? And uh, I was, I came away from watching the four hours, and went one of those kind of conversations where you kind of go, "Did it? I'm never getting that time back." You, you know that that kind of <laughs> you know, that's four hours of my life I never get back. And somebody just put one question. You know what the start? Well, it's just and said, "Okay, whatever you think." If I ask you one question, you tell me the answer to it. And as soon as they asked that one question, I was like, oh, that like changes my whole experience of, of that movie now. Because mm. uh, it was like one of those things. Mm. At what point of the movie did you think this? And you're like, well, it, oh, maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was, you know, and you kind of do that biting back and forward. And often just planting. That's where the beauty of body reads and body watching and doing all those things come from. Somebody else's perspective just went, yeah, you think that's fairly simplistic and whatever else. But what if? And you go. Oh my god, my mind's just been blown, you know, with all the possibilities of all the different <laughs> ways that people could have seen that, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff. And that's where storytelling's like the best thing in the world. Definitely, definitely. Also, as Chris, as you said, it makes uh, staying in all the time reading kind of worth it because you're still chatting with your friends. Oh, yeah, none of this going out, Lark, that you seem to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> He's giving me stick for going out to the pub. <laughs> Jealousy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> my going out is sitting on my porch reading. That's where I go out to. <laughs> That's not a very British thing at all, sitting out in porches reading. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh. Love a porch. <laughs> I always wondered if the pub was just like a, one of those things that people talk about, or if it was really a really a thing oh, in the UK like, is. so it's it's cool yeah. um, I think it used to be more so to be honest it, uh, the younger younger generation um, <laughs> don't do it as much like the pub wasn't really excessively busy but it is um, quite an English pastime for sure um, I guess Irish um, going to the pub and being sociable again so luckily I was with a bunch of book nerds oh, so that was good <laughs> this hobby of ours is developing into something unrecognisable <laughs> it's becoming a spectator sport yeah huh? wow yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh have you guys seen that um there's a there's a trend at the moment where people are having um silent book clubs so you literally go to a pub and you read but with other people so you're being sociable but not sociable <laughs> it's a really interesting concept you're like i'm just gonna go and not talk to people but in the same room but- I have a friend not <laughs> that goes to the bar by himself and brings hobbies with him. So whatever he's into, even when he, you know, like knitting, or bring knitting with him. Sit and have a. P- well, no, no, like, like sit and have a pint at like six o'clock in the evening. Just bring that or bring a jigsaw with him. You know, the, the thing is quiet enough to bring a jigsaw, and he says it's awesome. It's kind of if, if you're feeling lonely, you're having some sort of social interaction is better than than none. Well, I suppose that, I suppose that's that that might, that might be true about it or otherwise. But I just thought that it, it wasn't just him. If you know what I mean, yeah, yeah, it's kind of like a communal thing. And I don't know, like obviously this is kind of a bit of a stereotype, I suppose. But like when you're saying the younger generation, when I, when I was that, when you become a regular at a bar or at a pub. And you don't realise that you're seen as a regular. Like it's a, it's a it's a weird moment where somebody kind of you get something that other people aren't getting because you're a, a regular, and you're like, oh, I've made some life choices here that maybe <laughs> I need to think about. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you were going to go the other way of being like, it's nice to be part of a group. But you were like, no, well, oh, it, it is it is definitely nice to be part of a group. But no, <laughs> I thought you were going to go yeah. the cheers thing. <laughs> Chris, everybody just you know, you know. Would, would would not be nice though. Everybody wanted every pub to be like Cheers, so wasn't it? Was not the, the thing that, that that you could walk in and be known by, like people that all seem to be sort of sober. Like that's the thing about Cheers. Like nobody was past the point of, you know, oh Chris, you know, while they slide off the end of the table, um, <laughs> they seem to be able to hold down conversations and relationships and all of that kind of stuff. Bert still being a pub setting. So. Maybe that is what all American pubs are like. That's a good point. Is the pub not a thing in America? No. Are you no. all too far spaced no. out? Is that... <laughs> Fair enough. Just your porches then. Just your porches. Oh, see, I live in Wisconsin and we have like a bar like on every corner. 
and they're 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 it's pretty much all the same loud obnoxious you know they, <laughs> it's i don't really go i don't really go out very much just because I, I just don't find it enjoyable mm-hmm. I'd, I'd rather you know you know pick up a bottle of bourbon or something and just hang out you know with my friends at, at you know their place or my place and just do that because it's just you know bars in the u.s are just i just find them to be more obnoxious than anything else yeah too sports focused and um yeah. you know uh beer spilling and what have you <laughs> so, i wouldn't want to bring a book to one of those places because it would probably get wet. <laughs> yeah i think Where's the different English... different yeah Sorry, English pub is Sunday dinner as well, you know. This is yeah. it's got a good carvery, or you know, can be family friendly. So it's entirely different. Yeah, I think. Indeed. entirely different. Yeah. Oh, wow. Doesn't always have music either. They might have live band. They might just be nothing, just having two chats. Now, what I will say is, if anybody comes to WorldCon and it's in Glasgow, <gasps> you're not maybe going to get exactly that experience. <laughs> I plan to be there. So mm. so excited. I've yet to buy my ticket, Monty, yeah. but I am excited about going. So oh, I look to see if you could buy them. I don't think you can yet, or maybe I've, I'm not register, looking at the right place. Oh, right, okay. Currently, we have so. to make sure we look after each other in that in that regard. Yeah. Also, there does seem to be a discount if you've not been to Welcome before, so make sure you get the right ticket. Oh. Oh, in, wow. in person, yeah. I, yes. When I look to register, anyway. <laughs> you haven't done any conventions or anything yet, Christopher? Have you? You haven't done any like meetups. Uh, I've done a couple of uh, local book signings. Uh, There is a convention coming up um, uh, in September, which I'm trying to get in on. I'm just waiting for final confirmation. Uh, It's it's an actual like book convention, which is nice. But yeah, I I do want to start doing more live events. Those are always so much fun. Always enjoy doing those. Just sitting behind a table with a stack of books and just (laughs) just talking with people, you know. And uh, I've, I've I've always been very fortunate. The uh, all the signings I've done, there's only one that I did where I didn't sell out of books, so it's it's, it's always gone very wow. well for me. Nice. I was going to ask, is it, you, you, do you find it exciting or nerve-wracking as an author? But clearly, you just answered that. It's just exciting to, mm-hmm. to see people and chat with them. It. Yeah. Well, in a in a former life, and I and I posted this on Twitter, I used to be a musician, a touring musician. So um, I'm I'm just I'm I'm used to being you know up in front of people and and entertaining and all that. Uh, at one point, I did uh, well. My band, we we did uh, six U.S. tours, so I've, I've been around. Uh, I've always enjoyed entertaining people, and you know, I just um, after after fifteen years of playing music, I just decided, you know, this it's tough creating with four other people. You know, you, you have personalities <laughs> clashing, creative differences, and I, I kind of just learned that I, I create better on my own, and uh, just haven't looked back. Well, we talked a little bit about that yesterday too, Chris, with uh, it, writing being a solitary, but also you have a team, or other people involved, and uh, so it's not just one person. I mean, someone, someone else is involved at some point. I'm guessing. Got covers? Yeah, we were talking about your cover, uh, your cover artist earlier, Christopher. Oh yeah. Um, and uh, w- how did you get involved with him? And like, so when I decided really decided that I was going to go the self pub route. I was like, all right, well, now now I have to now I have to find an artist and so I I just went to to Google and I just searched for, you know, best uh best book cover artists or something. I I, I don't know, I don't know exactly what I searched <laughs> for, but I'm trawling through articles and articles and um came on this one article and uh saw J Caleb design. I think he was ranked like number 5th or 6th. Um, but when I saw the samples of his work, I was like, "Whoa!" You know, like, like th- this is exactly what I want. Where it's 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 realistic, but it's also you know still ha- has that like cartoony type of vibe. You know, it's, it's 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 definitely serious in the way he 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 presents it. And so I, I went to his website, looked through his catalog of work. I was like, "Oh my god, this is the guy!" Like this is the guy. And I, I hit him up and um, told him about the book, told him what I was looking for. I gave him the option of four different settings for the cover of Hellborn King. Um, gave him the description of the character, and I just said, go. Show me what you come up with. And then the cover of the Hellborn King, that was his first try. He came up with that. And I, I was just blown away 
I was like, man, this is this is one of the best book covers I've ever seen. And I've had so many people on Twitter tell me that they just blind bought the book just because they saw the cover art and they loved it. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, being 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 a self published author, your your cover art is your most important piece of marketing. So, yeah. anybody that's listening to this that is considering getting into self pub, save up some money, do it right. Spend the money on, on on a really nice cover; it'll pay dividends for you. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very true. Yeah, I fully agree with that. I've seen, I think a lot not um like say contra- controversial, but I would say a, a fair amount of the issues with self published books are that people don't mm-hmm. invest in that. I think, and people see them as not as good purely based on the cover, and then don't go much further than that. So I think having a strong cover is just, um, yeah, Mm -hmm. definitely pay dividends. I think that perception is definitely changing, though, because, I mean, you see on Twitter just so many amazing, so many amazing pieces of cover art. Uh, In fact, I, uh, for the life of me, I can't remember Mm -hmm. which author it was, but I saw one recently on Twitter. It just made me so jealous. I'm like, God, this is just gorgeous. It was just just amazing. I'm like, man. (laughs) That's awesome, but you know, indie indie self you know fantasy self pub fantasy, it's it's come a long way, and uh, you know, according to who you talk to out there, it's it's uh, picking up where traditional publishing has kind of dropped the ball. I mean, name a you know name a recently mm-hmm. published traditional book that that has a a, a mind blowing uh, piece of cover art. It, 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 a lot of the times, it's just generic. It's not all that impressive, and you know the. Uh, some of the stories that are getting put out there are just, you know, I mean, they're okay or whatever, but there's just so much creativity and so much talent in the indie scene right now. I mean, you, you got to get involved with it if, if you haven't. Anybody that's listening, if you have doubts about indie fantasy, just go on Twitter. There's there's so many good authors, so many good authors out there that are really deserving of your time. Incredible. I um, I bookmarked J.K. Elden Design after our last thing. I always just go on there. It's the wealth of covers that he has. Amazing. And often great for like, what should I read? You look and see a cover that really grabs you and maybe the whole series is there and you're just kind of like, oh, that's awesome. And I don't know, this has kind of gone over old ground, but he does typography <laughs> better than probably anybody else that I've ever seen. We can probably see it from, you know, Christopher's books so the kind of mix of the, the traditional fan of the kind of more aggressive kind of more modern fonts. I just that's so hard to but it can be a metal font. Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm sorry, are we skipping over the fact that Chris you literally choose books based on not even the prologue, not the back of it, not anything, just the cover. Look at it. Well that is good bond to be fair. <laughs> But it's it's more so than when you're looking for something fresh and that nobody's really talking about it. You want to discover it. Like I always think, book discovery, music discovery, movie discovery is such one of the best parts about a lot. Kind of finding something fresh that nobody's influenced you on otherwise. I'm trying to find that kind of blank canvas is very very hard in the modern world. Like well, usually you've seen it somewhere done anything. And I think that in that case, especially J.K. Designs' web page just has this this thing of you get a very strong idea of theme. You get a very strong idea of what the book's about from his covers, you know, as you, as you can see mm-hmm. even from Christopher's there. And you can kind of go, right, that catches my eye. Now let's go read the, the blurb that goes with it. Now let's see whether that's something that would be interested. So covers, you know, obviously do play a massive part of that. But the, that discovery part of it, having a, a resource like that that isn't just a whole load of blurbs or, or otherwise. People use uh, SPFBO to do exactly the same thing. You know, here's 300 new books, 300 new blurbs. Let's, let's see what I can discover. You absolutely can judge a book by its cover, especially nowadays. You have to. <laughs> mm-hmm. So there's so many books. You see, that's the that's the thing. And and as the truth goes, I think the idea used to be that only some of them will be good. That like if it is, a lot of these books are very very good. You know, they're very well crafted and well put together. It's, it's unusual to read a bad book. I often think in, in a lot of days it's been through some sort of process or you know you know somebody's time and effort that they put into. So like trying to find what book you should read can be quite difficult yeah and Christopher how relieved are you that you have an artist that you know you can depend on to do your covers and you're not someone who's just starting off and trying to avoid AI because having oh. a, a cover with AI is like a death sentence Ooh. I mean it is yeah hard. I mean, you, you're labeled as like this villain right away yeah, I would ne- I would never ever in a million years consider doing AI and uh you know 
putting a book together and you know publishing getting it out into the world it's it's a very time consuming stressful thing to do and having an artist that i can that i can rely on i mean it just it totally takes that weight off my shoulders because when i send him that email and i tell him you know you know the title of the book um w- roughly what i'm thinking idea wise i already know it, it, it it's going to be done and it's going to be awesome i mean it's just it's you know the, the only stressful part is like is like waiting for him to to send it to me you know because because i just want to see it <laughs> so but I mean, he, I mean, he's knocked it out of the park every time, yeah. every time. Uh, and, and I've only, I've only ever had him do small tweaks. Like for, for example, on the Hellborn King, Damien uh, originally had hair. I said, uh, you know, he's he's actually bald in the book, so he went back and and fixed that. And then on the Wrathbringer, uh, Titan had a hood over his head. I was like, you know, I, I'd like to take the hood off and just see more of his face. And then with Servitor of Sin, um, I had him change the, the the color of his of his armor because it was a little too bright. So just little just little ticky tack stuff like that, but. Ninety nine point nine percent of it, he just he just nails on the first try, and it's uh, the the cover for the Wrathbringer. I got it right here. This was actually not what I had intended. I gave I gave him a different idea for Titan. I wanted Titan to have more of an action pose, so he sent me that. But then he also said, "Well, you know what? I I, I was feeling inspired, and I I had him in more of a stoic pose. What do you think about that?" And I was like, "That's it." It's probably a tight it, yeah. it, It's not even. It's not yes. even what I asked for, but he nailed it, and I was like, "Absolutely, it, it, it's better than I than I even imagined it would be." So you know, having having a guy that's that talented and can just is not afraid to take the ball and run with it. It's 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 awesome. Uh, he's going to be designing all my book covers. I told him if you ever plan on retiring, let me know because I'm going to have you do like all of them before a whole mess of them, just all up front, <laughs> so I have them. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny so i have to, i have to know what was your 26 hour shift what, what what was that about what how did you how did you manage to you know, eat that long well my uh my my day job is uh, i'm a manager at a, a landscaping company and so uh during winter we do snow removal and uh i'm also a, a manager in that role too so it's you know when you have an event you know when you're getting you know a foot of snow in a night that's that's a lot of hours that you got to put in, and 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 the company I work for services hundreds hundreds of sites, and so, you know, when you when you get a system that's just hanging out over the top, you just dumping snow, dumping snow. It's it, you're out there working until you're done, and uh, I would do I would do like 16 hours on, and then I get maybe an hour or two off, and then I would do like another 10 hours on after that, and it's just I'd just be dead to the world. Robin's Robin's surprise. I was like, "What? What? What? No! I yeah, I can't function on no sleep though. I just it doesn't happen. So that, that to me, that's insane. <laughs> Kudos yeah, I, to you I, for I, sure. I barely survived it this past winter. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, I was going through I was going through a lot of personal stuff too. Steve knows oh, about it. I was yeah. going through some per, some really heavy personal stuff this past winter. So it just. It, it it made it made the long shifts and, and the sleep deprivation that much worse. It just it, it was just not a good winter. This winter will be a lot better. Mm-hmm. I, my, my my role is changing slightly, and the the drama that I was consumed in is is <laughs> in the past now. So hopefully I'll I'll have more energy and more creative uh, space to to keep writing consistently this winter. Because I can't keep Chris waiting for the next book. You're dumb, wants. right? I mean, you can you can take your time, but there's a certain point that patience runs out. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I was going to ask because of that. You said you had a, like a difficult winter, and you also said like the it's amount, so sheer amount of writing that you've been doing it seems well insane to me. Maybe normal to other people, but like you said, you're kind of um, dealing with <laughs> some potential burnout. I was like, do you not? Do you have you ever considered maybe taking a break, or do you think that would make it worse for you? At like taking a break, coming back fresh, or whatever. Do you think you're continuing is kind of actually helping you to oh, stay? That's, um, that's such a good question, and I go or, back and forth yeah, on it all the time. Um, I have thought, you know, maybe I'll just take you know a couple of months and I'll just kind of lay low on social media. I won't do any writing, this or that, and then, you know, 
as as fate mm-hmm. would have it, you know, the the books have been selling really, really well the past couple of months, and so it's like I, I don't I don't want to fade from relevance right while I'm finally starting to get some some <laughs> major traction going. But um, I'm just gonna pace myself. I'm just gonna take it in small chunks. If you know, if if I don't feel like writing on a particular night, I'm not gonna force mm-hmm. myself. You know, um, if uh, if mm-hmm. I if if I am writing and I don't get as much done as I wanted, I'm not gonna you know beat myself up about it the way I used to. You know, I'll let. I mean, some nights I would stay up till like eleven thirty writing, and then I have to be up at you know yeah. quarter to five, and and <laughs> I. I would just, I, I, I just, I, I would like beat myself up. Like I wanted to write a thousand words tonight, and I got seven fifty, and I, I, like it would bother me. It's like, damn, I'm not hitting my goals, you know. But now it's like, hey, you know, I wrote three hundred fifty words tonight. It's better than zero. I'll take it. Yeah, yeah it is. That's so, very, very sensible. Don't look at Chris's face. Chris, stop bullying. <laughs> I'm trying my best, but sometimes, you know, your face belies what you say, you know, it's just the way it is. I, I, I say this a lot, but RJ Barker, has his Twitter feed's great for that. Uh, 800 words done today, I think that'll do me for today. That's kind of all he just posts, and it's like, yeah, there's a professional writer, and he's he's kind of at least, whether he's doing that or not, it's that, that kind of mentality, I think, is kind of healthy to kind of say, look, you do what you can do, and then... I mean, if I was making enough off my books that I could just be a full-time author, I mean, this wouldn't be an issue whatsoever. Yeah. I would just, I'd be cranking, I'd be cranking these things out. But, you know, life, uh, life gets in the way of that. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mr. Cahill could be having a, a book off every year, you know. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, that 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 guy's a beast, and and he's he's really opened the door wider to a lot of other indie authors. Yeah. I mean, because so many people have have fallen in love with his books and it's changed a lot of people's opinions on on self-published fantasy and so a a lot i think a lot of us are having the are seeing the downstream effect of that for sure for sure Hmm. Hmm. yeah it's it's that idea and i think a lot a lot of this is lost in kind of capitalist society when people kind of protect their own you know their own corner of the world but they don't actually realize that greater exposure Right across for all self pub books is actually better for them individually as well. You know, actually, the more right. you know, if they, if you can help and champion everybody, you will automatically you know rise up out of that as well. With it, you know? yeah, absolutely. And and, and I uh, I put some up on Twitter. Well, it's it's X now or whatever it's called. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I put something up and I was like, hey, you know, um, you know, I've been I've, I've been very fortunate lately with a lot of people buying my books. You know, I, I want to return the favor. And I said, you know, if you haven't, you know, if you're an indie author and you haven't sold a, a, a book in the past 30 days, post me a screenshot of your dashboard and give me a link to your ebook and I'll buy it. And so yeah. yesterday I bought a whole bunch of ebooks from guys that, you know, have, have been struggling because, you know, I, 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 I know what it's like when you look at the dashboard and it's been weeks and it's just nothing. And then mm-hmm. you see that one, that, that one little tick, <laughs> that, that one little bar and you're just like, yes. I haven't been forgotten, yeah. so you know I, I wanted to spread some goodwill to some other authors, and I was actually talking with a guy who had just published in July, uh, and was giving him a whole you know just we were just DMing each other, and I was giving him a whole bunch of advice just from mistakes I made starting out, and I was just giving him advice because like his ebook was, is like ninety nine pages, but he priced it at like eight bucks. I'm like Oof. I made that mistake starting out, and, and my ebook was like six hundred and sixteen pages. I priced it at like seven ninety nine, and I didn't sell. I, I sold like maybe like two in the first like two months, but then when I dropped the price way down, start selling ebooks like crazy. And so I told him, you know, don't be afraid to drop your price and you know, make money off of volume because you know, an ebook. I mean, it, it's really hard for people to justify spending more than you know three, four, five dollars on an ebook. So you know. Just, just little things like that that you don't know unless you know, right? So I, 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 I always wanted to make myself accessible to other authors or people who are thinking about becoming authors, and just give them, you know, uh, just give them advice based off of what I've seen and mistakes I've made and everything, and just you know, try, try, try to make the indie scene a little bit stronger. Nice. Uh, Jared, are you? Uh, is your time up? I don't want to keep you too long. Actually, yeah, I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> I try to keep the time zones are a nightmare for me. Everyone's everywhere. Uh, awesome. Yeah. 
See, for me, I would say Steve lives in the most awkward of all time zones. You know, it's not one of the main ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What are you talking about? Steve? I'm in Mountain. Mountain, okay. Yeah. I'm in Central. Yeah, we're Sorry. only an hour apart. What is Mountain? Yep. That, that's not a, that's we have not lots a of mountains here. <laughs> that's a, yeah. say, you hear what I'm saying, Robin. You understand, you know. <laughs> Steve's a mountain man. Yeah. Mountain what mountain are the man. are the winters like in the UK, Robin? What are the winters like for you? Are they snowy, rainy, cloudy? A bit of everything. Um, not so much snowy anymore. They used to be, um, but now they're really just kind of damp. <laughs> doesn't get doesn't get freezing cold. It's just yeah, kind of just a bit cloudy and damp, which is fair enough. And now, you should ask me what my um what my summers are like currently, <laughs> which is thirteen degrees and raining for the last couple of days. So <laughs> that's been great. Um, but yeah, pretty just mild. UK is just mild. Yeah, it goes down to about seven or eight and raining. You know, winter that's kind of oddly kind of yeah. thing. I like it. Yeah, though. but this. So that's 55 degrees Fahrenheit for anyone, uh, anyone <laughs> curious. But 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 for what would be sort of a moderate climate with no real extremes, the British's fascination with weather is off the scale. <laughs> Honestly, a proper fascination with the difference of two degrees. It's just un, unheard of. We love it. We love talking about weather. <laughs> <laughs> It's always sort of raining, or rain's never too far away, or you know. I like I do. The one thing I've always said about things weather is, it, is at least it's interesting. Like you do get people who come over and don't understand that you will have to take an umbrella. You might have to layer up, and you need a coat because people expect the weather to stay the same. Whereas in the UK, it can be rainy, it can be snowy, you can have sunshine, it, like throughout the whole day, and that makes it fun. So at least you're always on your toes. <laughs> Kind of sounds like Wisconsin. I mean, some some days we have all four seasons yeah. in one day. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I like that. I can't imagine living because I was in Europe, obviously, and it was just sunny all the time. Like, I was like, this is miserable. This is properly miserable. <laughs> you know, all of this, like, one climate, one, like... <laughs> temperature heat. like you'd probably remember was it two years ago robin when it was really warm in the uk for an extended period of a week and a half when everybody sort of died <laughs> i remember just sitting in the yeah. high school and it didn't matter <laughs> because ac isn't a thing in the uk at all so hmm. if it gets no. warm and by warm 24 25 degrees centigrade you can work that out steve uh it was like honestly unlivable yeah you just i remember just sitting yeah. everybody's just lying naked in the house going this is dead <laughs> This is just not. <laughs> this is the end. I'm not sure everyone was naked, but yeah, yeah. It was, they it was, were. It was they funny. were. <laughs> oh, a good climate. Yeah. I think it was. I did some business travel to Wisconsin. I went to, uh, was it Menominee Falls? I don't know if you know where that I think it's outside of. Uh... That's where I work, actually. Oh, really? Menominee Falls, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah I, went, I went. I was there quite a bit, yeah, for. For work stuff, so nice place, yeah, nice area. Though. Yeah, Nominee Falls. Sounds like a find a Nemo joke there, but the Nemini. <laughs> <laughs> they, they told me to remember it by it was spelled me no money. I think that's what the way it was. Uh, that was their there was their like punchline was you know, how to remember the name, but yeah, it was a nice place. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's like my wallet. Me, no money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All dirty. those books. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. Okay, so for your books, have you ever thought about doing other, like, um, if you may meet people in person, have you ever thought about doing other, what am I trying to say, merchandise related to your books? Is that something you would consider um, for in person meetups, or are you just like, uh, I do have an online store. I sell T-shirts, posters, oh. mugs. I mean, oh. you name it. Yeah. In fact, the, the, post, the posters I have on the wall behind me, those are ordered off off my website. Yeah. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Mm-hmm. Awesome. That's awesome. I know some people get um, uh, old about it. I, I, I like book merchandise. Mm-hmm. That's really good. And if you use the code Hellborn twenty, get twenty percent off your first order. Like, how cool would it be? Like, I often think this. 
know you're walking down the street in like a Hellborn King t-shirt and you just see the recognition in one person's eyes right across like across the street like that, that would be just the most incredible feeling <laughs> maybe it'll happen someday. Maybe it'll happen someday. <laughs> yeah, maybe someday. Uh, I, I I did have somebody tell me um, in a DM that they were in a Barnes and Noble in Las Vegas and they saw one of my books on the shelf and I'm like, wow. I'm like I'm like, like how's this even possible? Because because I only do the the print on demand through them. So the only thing I can figure is maybe somebody out there ordered a copy. It arrived at the store and they just never picked it up and so they decided just to throw it out on the shelf but uh yeah so and, and then i've had other people send me pictures from uh like half price books and you know other yeah. like you know um uh re- resellers or whatever where you know my books have, have popped up here and there so that that's that's super cool when, when when that happens whenever somebody says hey man i saw your book in a bookstore it's like what really <laughs> nice <laughs> So speaking of going off of Robin's question, I was browsing your your site and you, you have some Halberd King music too. Yes, yes. Uh, so I had a, I had a an actual Hollywood composer reach out to me and and he um, in exchange for signed copies of the books, he's creating uh, original tracks for me. And uh, the 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 one that he's done is on my website now. He's uh, he's going to make one inspired off of his reading of the Wrathbringer and then one for Servitor of Sin, which is which is awesome. That's yeah amazing. That's yeah. sweet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah check cool. it out. It's it's uh, yeah. on my website. I, I put it up on YouTube as well. Uh you just search Hellborn King. Um uh, the name of the track is Northern Spirit. Sure. It pops up. Yep. It's three wow. minutes long. It, it's 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 like really tribally is type. It? Uh I don't know if anybody's familiar with bands like Heilong or Bordruna, um, sort of like Norse neo folk type of music. You know, there's drums and some throat singing and stuff, and it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Never thought something like that would would, would happen. Hmm. Yeah, kind of yeah. just reaching yeah, out totally to you randomly, randomly as well. That's that's epic. That's super cool. Very, very cool. I've learned a lot recently. I was talking to some people. Um, last night and he was talking about how he does um he ended up writing Mm -hmm. for a video game or something and it ended up basically just being because he randomly contacted Mm -hmm. them and was like do you need any like whatever and they were like absolutely we'd love that and they ended up like spiraling into more and he ended up doing quite a few Mm -hmm. games with them and getting paid for it and stuff and i was like it's really i felt it was really one of those things where actually if you ever think oh i should just reach out and you don't you totally should because mm-hmm. so many things can come of it. I think it's awesome. Like some guy just being like, you know, I really love to make him some music, yeah. and you were really pleased with it. <laughs> like it's, a, well, it's you, just you, a really you, epic thing to do. I think. You, yeah, you, I mean, you miss you miss one hundred percent of the shots you don't take. So why not? Yeah. And when HBO do yeah, come absolutely. calling to make the TV series, there's somebody all ready with a foot in the door. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I mean, what really sold me on on. Uh, um, having this guy, you know, working with this guy, I went to his website and he he's done score for uh, like the Game of Thrones DVDs, wow. and I was like, whoa, that's that's really awesome. And he's done work for like American Horror Story and like some some movies and stuff. And I was like, man, th- I mean, this guy's like the real deal. And it's just you know, you oh, you, know, you never know what sort of connections you're going to make out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, speaking of music, what do you? I know you're a big music fan, but what are you listening to? these days uh, a little bit of everything um i listen to i mean i used to i used to be a real big like death metal guy back in the day not not so much anymore i'll mainly just listen to it at the gym but um a lot of neo folk a lot of post rock um <laughs> you guys are just kind of looking coming. at me like i'm speaking a different language right who, now but who are you That's, what did you do with christopher <laughs> <laughs> yeah um <laughs> I do I, I do listen to a bit of black metal still, especially when I write certain certain characters like like Lucetta. It, it's just <laughs> the dark, most dark evil stuff I can find. Um, but yeah, I, um, <laughs> such a good character. Honestly, awesome. when you That's read awesome. this yeah, book, and you, yeah. mean, you think when you're reading Lucetta, <laughs> exactly. What you were doing. I've uh, dabbled in a little bit of Sleep Token lately. They're 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 a band that's really blowing up, and that's a band that's totally outside my wheelhouse. 
because like like I got thrown for a total loop when I heard them because they'll they'll do they'll do like heavy metal and then they'll do like hip hop and then right. they'll do like funk or whatever like all in the same song and it's just like hmm. like like who are these people like you know so I don't know I just just kind of perusing and seeing what the YouTube algorithm f- throws my way and you know if it sounds good I'll listen to it my 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 musical tastes have really expanded a lot like or especially over like the last 5 6 years I used to be really close minded with music it's like if it ain't heavy I ain't listening to it but now it's like you know I'm I'm open to pretty much anything now hmm. But you Jared what are you listening to these days uh, I listen to a lot of um more the prog metal stuff uh, the, the dream theaters and the stuff like that, but I also like to venture into into a little bit of jazz and um, hmm. uh, even some uh, occasional like Renaissance type music sometimes. So it's pretty wide variety of stuff. It's usually not popular stuff though on the radio. I don't really go for the radio mm-hmm. stuff. <laughs> yep. Well, you, Robin, you, and, uh, you I'm guessing you're a black metal. Hundred percent, hundred percent. No, um, I don't know. It's easy to say what I don't listen to than what I do, but I generally, I would say, um, my gradient in the middle is just ambient house music, oh. <laughs> hmm. um, like Bonobo. People yeah, like that Bonobo love Bonobo. Correct, but yeah. today I was listening to, today I was listening to Jurassic Five and then oh, some country. So. Jurassic Five I've listened to in years. Wow. I know. I had I had a hankering yeah. for some reason, so that's what I was doing today. <laughs> what are you, Chris? What are you listening to these days? Um, I'm sort of a bit all over the place. I've been doing a lot of <laughs> listening to a lot of Brazilian music recently for some reason. It's very summery. You see, I think that's that's very much it. The kind of Brazilian funk, seventies, eighties kind of thing is pretty great. And uh, I I sort of get steered down places that my kids are listening to as well because they like especially the youngest one is getting very into 60s 70s but also has discovered Slipknot System of Down doing all that kind of stuff much to the horror of their mother because <laughs> it's like what what has happened this beautiful child you know and I'm like this is this is pretty cool but uh, uh, they've also <laughs> forced me back down into a big Beatles hole as well so I've actually been doing a lot of Beatles the past week actually just popped up but between that and Bowie and uh, I don't know what else. A lot of jazz as well. I always, always listen to a lot of, a lot of jazz is good for, especially when I'm reading. Uh, it's the one thing yeah. that, uh, that I can kind of stick on the background. Something with lyrics. But nobody might do it as well. Like a bit of ambient house might 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 do that as well. But a subtract or something even be something like that would do. It, yeah, it's great for reading. It really is great for reading. Just having it in the background, just something with a little bit of a beat. And, that's and, not and I have a good friend that does a weekly music battle. So he picks to he puts up on Twitter and he says, "Right, go ahead." So he, it, sometimes they're impossible. So one was uh, Mass, Massive Attack Mezzanine versus Air Moon Safari, which I just found completely impossible. But this week's is uh, ACDC, Back to Black, and uh, Number of the Beast by Air Moon. So I'm sort of listening to those as well as a kind of, yeah, I'll give them a bit of feedback on that. So. Hmm. Pick your which were you leaning on that Well, you, Steve. <laughs> I was oh, gonna say, what yeah, about yeah. you, um, I've been, I've been, I've, I've made the mistake of getting on Bandcamp, and um, it's been bad for my wallet. Um, but lately, I've been listening to some Rolo Tomasi. Is what I've been listening oh, to. Oh, very good. Yeah. I did see as well. You were talking about um, internet radio stations. I saw that. Post. Yes, I didn't, I didn't know that was a thing until um, I YouTube recommended this post this video to me about it you know having your own internet radio station i don't know that i didn't know that was a thing and i apparently it is but you can uh, jump on and create your own station and play whatever you want it's kind of and neat. That presumably people listen because i remember hopefully i'm sure that's been around for ages because i'm sure i remember like finding random radio stations ages and ages ago i just haven't done it haven't done it recently but yeah there used to be an iTunes when it first launched. There used to be like an internet radio section that used to let, collate all the streams and used to just go down and just click them. It was just like a massive list of them used to get in old versions of iTunes, I remember. I used to, way back, this is like mid, it was like 2000, I don't know, a long time ago. I used to listen to uh, <laughs> radio stations on Winamp. I don't know if those oh, of you yeah, out there who remember Winamp. Winamp. Yeah. And there was like a internet radio station thing and you can pick different stations and 
Yeah, that was I always had that running in the background. But yeah, I thought they went away, but apparently they didn't. But it's it sounds like a lot of work because you have to promote it and you have to like get it out there and nobody listens to it and you're paying for it. It's kind of like, what's the point? It's just what you need, though, Steve, as yeah. another hobby. Another thing to <laughs> put your time and energy into. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm like, I don't need, I don't need anything else. It's tempting, but, you know, we'll see. I don't know. I still think you should put up some more playlists on the forum, though, for sure, Steve. I like, I like you listen to like a range of music and a lot of things you bring up I'm like oh my god I haven't listened to that in an mm. age so recommend hmm. that you put more of those up <laughs> okay yeah I'll do that yeah awesome yeah I'll do that up yeah, yeah. but uh, I know time gets away from us all the time uh, it starts to it's just before you notice an hour and a half in but I was getting late for Robin on the on the other side of the pond and Chris is getting late for you too but uh, Christopher, I want to thank you for coming by. I really appreciate it. I mean, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Really appreciate your support and friendship, and it means a lot. So, thank you for being a friend and being an awesome author. So, I don't know how you do it, thank but you. you do it. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 thank you, man. Thanks for everything, and thanks for having me back. It's it's always great talking to you and Chris, and it's nice meeting you, Jared and and Robin. This is this has been a lot of fun. Yes. So before we go, where can people find you if they want to buy your books or buy your merch or listen to the music that you've made for the books or all these all other things you have going on? Where can, where can people find more information and uh, where can people sign up for your mailing list? Uh, ChristopherGBrenning.com. Uh, if you sign up for my mailing list, uh, you get a free you get a link to a free ebook download for the new novella, Servitor of Sin. Um, it's got all my links on there. Um, I'm the most active on, on Twitter, aka X now. I really hate that he changed it to that but uh that's uh <laughs> that's where you can find me uh is, is on uh twitter nice and jared we're gonna be able to find you uh i have my youtube channel the fantasy thinker and um i am also doing a, a blog on page mm -hmm. dot com. yes that's called creative crossroads so you can check that out i try to do it weekly we'll see if i can keep that up <laughs> very good stuff. Yeah, very good stuff. And Jared, you do some Thank awesome you. videos too, so everyone should go check yeah. them out. Definitely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Very good stuff. And Robin, where can people find you? Sorry, I was trying to find Christopher. <laughs> um, on Twitter. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, you can find me on X uh, under Bookends and Biscuits and on my YouTube channel of uh, Bookends and Biscuits. So, yeah, thanks for having me. It's been oh, really good fun. And uh, of course, Chris, where can people find you? Uh, X sounds really dweeby, doesn't it? That's really what it is. It's it, a, it sounds like I, something I, I would have called it in the 90s or something. Uh, you can find me on YouTube, <laughs> my name, Chris Mullen, or you can find me in the Patreon forums, or hopefully on a Friday conversation or something in the, in the near future. Yes, always uh, open anytime. Any, any of you are welcome anytime. Just let me know. Just let me know when and we'll figure it out. But thanks to everyone Perfect. for listening. Really appreciate everyone's time, and we will talk to everyone very soon.